graduated from college in 1953. I went into the service shortly thereafter. I stayed in the military for 14 years, 9 months, and 29 days. I left the service in 1965. I never went back to Houston to live. That's how I wound up in the city of Olympia and now the city of Lacey. That gives you a background of who I am and what I've done. <clears throat> As I said, I went to a segregated school. As I was telling, as we were riding here this morning, I flunked the first grade. And I use that when I talk to young people such as yourselves to let you know that all is not pretty. But I didn't flunk. At the time that I was in school, public school, you had to be five years, uh, six years old in order to be enrolled. Well, I stayed in a rather small community. The schools were the center of the community, along with the churches. Now, my brother, who was eight years older than I, loved comic strips. Superman, Batman, Flash, and all those good things. I could not read at that time, but I loved to look at his comic books. And I saw these little bubbles over these heads, and I didn't understand what they meant. So I wanted to learn how to read. <clears throat> so every day the kids would be walking, going, going to school. I'd go out and I'd be crying because I wanted to go to school. So the teacher who taught the first grade stayed about three blocks from our house. And she'd walk by our house every day. And she saw me out there crying. And she said to my mother, what's wrong with that boy? And my mother told him. And she said, well, put some clothes on him and send him on over to school. So I went to school, five years old. I was in class for a whole year, but I wasn't registered. <laughs> so that's why I say I flunked the first grade, because I had to do the first grade again. But I learned a lot. Although I wasn't enrolled, I had advantage of all the things that the other kids did. And I did learn how to read. And when I was in the third grade, <clears throat> they said I was good enough to be skipped to the fifth grade. So I skipped the fourth grade. And then in my system at that time, they only had one through, no, no kindergarten, one through six, seven through 12. So when I graduated, <clears throat> excuse me, graduated high, uh, elementary school, went to high school, and that was quite an adventure because one day I was big man on the campus at elementary school, yippee. Next day, I'm nothing <laughs> as a nothing in high school. But that was all right, that was all right. In my at the school district at that time, you needed 18 credits to get out of graduate from high school. The way they had this thing out for, for, to go through four years of high school, seventh and eighth didn't count. <clears throat> you, every class, is what we call a heavy class, was worth a half a credit, with the exception of PE. And everybody had to take PE. That was only worth a quarter of a credit. But if you had a, B, a, B, a better grade point average, you didn't have to take study hall. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I had to accumulate, I had to set myself up to make sure that I had a B or plus because I didn't want to take study hall. And I did that for four years. And I eliminated a whole semester off of my high school experience. So I graduated from high school at the grand old age of 16. And I was the valedictorian of the class. Now I was getting to the point that what I was asked to be is, I had never spoke to a group of people more than my classmates. And as I walked in, I noticed that all of you were having a conversation of one type or another. 
to each other, but you weren't necessarily standing as I am, speaking to a group as you are. Now, put yourself in this situation. I'm a 16-year-old kid, and I had been going to school with most of my graduating seniors all of my life. I knew most of them, a lot of them. I had no problems talking to them, but I didn't know their parents or their grandparents or their sisters or their brothers unless they were students at the same school. So 260 students in my graduating class with the parents and the grandparents and the friends and blah, 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 there's a lot of people there. But remember one other thing that I said. The school system that I went to was a segregated school system. So that meant there was also a white person representing the school district in that auditorium. And I had never, never spoken to a white person under these conditions. So I was very concerned about that. When the vice president, uh, vice principal of the school notified me that I was to be the valedictorian of my class, I initially told him, that's nice. And he told me what I had to do at the graduation. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't do those things. I don't talk. I don't talk, not in public. And he said, well, <clears throat> this is quite an honor. So I suggest you go home and talk to your mother about it, which I did. And um, I did, and I talked to her. My mother, keep in mind that this was during the Depression and during the Second World War, all, all of these things that I told you about were going on. My mother had never set her foot in any school that I go into, elementary or high school, because she was a working woman. She worked every day. So that also gives you an indication I never had any discipline problems either, so remember that. <laughs> uh, I had, um, she said, I'm going to be there to witness that. Yes. You had a question? You sure? No, yes. If you got a question, stop it. Um, <laughs> so I agreed that I would do the valedictorial speech. But then I had to write a speech, which I had never done before. And I had to come up with a, something that was going to be relevant to me and to my fellow classmates and to the audience also. So perhaps like some of you who, if you can recall when you were in elementary school or high school, what did you look forward to when you were looking forward to that out in the future? What was going to happen when you graduated? Well, in my case, in my, me and my classmates' case, it was commencement. We were looking forward to commencement. And in our vocabularies, in that context, commencement meant the end of high school. But then I began to think about words. And that's how, that's what, how we communicate with each other words, and if you have done something other than <clears throat> spell check, if you use a dictionary, uh, some other volume that gives meanings to words, you'll know that each word has several different meanings. And commencement also means the beginning. So. I developed my speech about commencement in that context of the beginning, not the end, the beginning of the rest of our lives. Now, how did I deliver that? Of course, I had a girlfriend, and she helped me with my speech. And uh, there were no such things as bullets in those days. So, you know, you wrote the whole thing out and then you committed it to memory. 
And then you figure, how am I going to deliver this? So my girlfriend at that time, she suggested to me that I'm going to be in the audience. And I knew that. And I'm going to be sitting next to your mother. And I said, I knew that. And she said, as I learned how to learn the speech, I looked at her. And that's who, to whom I delivered the speech that night. Not my mother, but to my girlfriend. Now, <laughs> this is um, <laughs> not how I hadn't planned on this, but um, whoever was the, uh, producing that particular event that night in that auditorium wanted everybody to have their attention on whoever was speaking at that time. So they turned the lights down in the auditorium and put the spotlight on me in my eyes. So and my girlfriend and my wife, I mean my, my girlfriend and my mother, were sitting in the rear. <laughs> I couldn't see them. <laughs> so here's where your imagination comes into play. I imagined where she was sitting. I knew where she was sitting, but I imagined that I could see her, and I delivered my speech. That is a method that I use today. Not my girlfriend. She's long. <coughs> well, she's no longer my girlfriend. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but each time I give a speech, I pick a person in the audience to whom I'm going to deliver it to. But I also, you know, move my face around as I do them down to make sure that each person in the audience knows that I am aware that he or she is present. And I deliver my speech to that person. Or if I don't have anybody in particular that I wish to speak to directly, I'll pick a point in space. And I deliver whatever I'm going to, to in space. But that's, that's, that's a method. You can choose your own methods. But let me say what you should do when you're delivering a talk to your fellow classmates, uh, your church, your synagogue, uh, just to a group. Know what you're going to say. Be aware of your subject matter. Try to stay away from slang. Try to stay away from idioms. Try to stay away from <laughs> words that you are aware of, but nobody else is aware of other than you. Because if you're going to be effective, you're going to have to communicate. And if you're going to communicate, if you're going to impart a thought, a part of your knowledge to someone else or someone else, then make sure that they receive that in a context that they are familiar with. Do that way. Now, I stopped at high school. I graduated from high school on a Friday night. Monday morning, I was a freshman in college, summer school. Again, big man on campus Friday, back to the bottom, of the, uh, the bottom of the list Monday morning. That was an experience because I had not wanted to go to college. College was the farthest thing in, in my mind. My mind the week before was to get out of high school. I had no idea what I was going to do beyond that. But as you probably know now, what employer is going to hire a 16-year-old kid who has no experience with anything. So my mother told me, you go to college or you get out of the house. <laughs> so you go to college. But what are you going to do in college? I had no idea, none whatsoever. Keep in mind that this was 1949, Houston, Texas segregated society. Black people had, excuse me, black was not in vogue in those days. Colored people had no choices 
if you graduate from college, you either teach school or you work for the post office. Not the postal service, the post office. I didn't want to do either, but I had to go to college. So what did I go to college for? I got to pay my way there first. So I had been, as a junior and senior in high school, I had a paper route. College was rather cheap in Houston, Texas in those days. And I'll tell you, I don't want, I don't want anybody faint when I tell you this. <clears throat> I went through four years of college, tuition, books, fees, everything, for a grand total of $125 a year. <laughs> tuition. $65 in the fall quarter, a uh, fall semester, $35 in the spring semester. That included library, student, everything. Now, <clears throat> my brother was four years older, uh, eight years older than I. He went to that school. And he majored in mathematics. I said to myself, what's the cheapest way I can go through school? So I I will go to school and declare my major as mathematics. Because I knew my brother had all the books that I'm going to need. <laughs> now, that's good. That's good. Because I took exactly the same curriculum that he did, quarter by quarter, although he was four years ahead of me. Teachers were not too innovative in those days. They used the same books, same thing. I, only one thing's wrong. My brother's a brilliant man, and he has some quirks. When he bought his math text, the first thing that he did, other than write his name in it, is to tear all the answers out of the back of the book. <laughs> that was a little disturbing to me, <coughs> because I'm not that smart. But. <laughs> He was one of my teachers because, as I said, he was ahead of me. And his philosophy in teaching of do, using the scientific method was to, if you do the process, if you learn the process, especially in mathematics and those true sciences, you'll come up with the right answer. So. I had to learn the process because I didn't have the answers anymore. And that's the way I went through. And I, I did fairly well. I, didn't, I had uh, several of the teachers that I had in college were of the school that the writer of the textbooks made A's. He made B's. The best you could do was a C. And most of the cases of my classmates, uh, that, that worked out to be very true. <clears throat> my case was not true always, but um, I got my share of C's. But grades did not necessarily mean everything, as it shouldn't be to you also. It's what you learn in the class and what you can apply and what you carry forward. If you come into a class, knowing everything, and you walk out of the class with nothing in addition, you should not expect an A, just because you walked out with everything that was taught, but you walked in there with it also. So, uh, and to make a long, uh, long story shorter, that's why I did not go into the teaching profession when I graduated. When I walked across the podium at the end of my uh, four years in college, uh, I realized that I would not be a teacher, although I was qualified. I went and did all the practice teaching and all that other stuff. But I knew I wasn't going to be a teacher because as I stand here before you, I went through, went across that podium. I waved at my mother and my girlfriend, by the way. Uh, and uh, same girl, too. Uh, I looked out there and I said to myself, what would I do if I were to stand before class and looked out and saw 30 of me staring at me. And that was enough to change my mind about the teaching profession. After I graduated from college, <clears throat> I had a military obligation. 
And I went in and uh, I went through. I did not go to officer's training because I had no desire. I, I was not going to be there that long. I was drafted. Uh, I wasn't going to be that long, so I went through uh, enlisted basic training and advanced individual training. And then at the end of my advanced individual training, they decided, Virgil, you got something on the ball. So all the rest of my platoon, or the battery it really was, they went to Korea. And they sent me to leadership school. They saw something of me I didn't know. And I enjoyed it. And there again, I made, sort of tuned up my leadership abilities and delivery and all of those types of things that you had to do as a leader in the military. And guided missiles were becoming the thing of the vo uh, thing in the military, so I decided I want to go to guided missile school. So I went to guided missile school, and that's how I wound up on the West Coast. And then it came out with another guided missile, and I went back and went to another guided missile school. And time went on, and before I knew it, I had uh, spent ten years in the military, and I was in San Francisco for eight of those. And I was in a pretty good situation. I thought I was a, a pretty good jockstrap. I somehow wound up on a volleyball team, and we won a few championships on the West Coast. And the general loved championships, and he kept us together for four years. But as generals go, he had a wife. And one day she wanted to retire, which meant <laughs> the volleyball team was gone. <laughs> he came in and told us, he said, uh, my wife wants to retire, but I'm going to do whatever I can for you, those of us that were on the team that have been together for six years or four years, and uh, go anywhere you want to go. And I had no other place. I hadn't been that many places. But one of the uh, colonels, with whom I had worked rather closely, came in and asked me, he said, um, you ever been to Seattle? No, 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 no. He said, well, I'm going to Seattle, and I'd like for you to go with me. And I said, fine, I've never been there before, so I'll go to Seattle. So we had to go to Florida to do some training first, and then we wound up in Seattle. And um, <laughs> the first time I used any of my academic training is that uh, I came up and we put in a, what is called a missile master. It's, uh, if you're familiar with Seattle, uh, uh, if you're familiar with Discovery Park, it was once called Fort Lawton. And uh, we put a missile master there. And uh, the missile master was a, a uh, control unit that controlled all of the guided missile units all over the Pacific Northwest to include uh, some of them in Canada. And we had the air, de air defense responsibility for everything that was in the air from the northern tip of Vancouver Island to Mountain View, Idaho, to Weeds, California, to a thousand miles out over the ocean. We had to know everything that was flying to include all the commercial aircraft. They had to file a flight plan between us. And a lot of them suffered because of it, because when you file a flight plan in a commercial aircraft, you have rules you have to follow. You're supposed to be where you say you're going to be, when you're going to be there. And if you are two minutes ahead of time, or two minutes behind time, or two miles outside of the corridor, we had the authority to call McCord Air Force Base and scramble an aircraft up there to go look at you. And if you were declared as a uh, friendly or non-hostile, uh, you were just outside of your corridor, you got fined $1,000. Not the airline, but you, the pilot. Lots of friends, lots of friends. <laughs> if you're in the military, you have to follow rules. I was a non-commissioned officer, and there were such things as non-commissioned officers' clubs 
<laughs> I never joined the non-commissioned officer club. But I had a sergeant major who loved non-commissioned officers clubs. So that's why he held all of his meetings for his non-coms. And I wouldn't go because I wouldn't remember. Well, I just told you I'm from Houston, Texas. I love the warm weather. <coughs> he was not from Houston, Texas. And he had more than 20 some years of service at that time. And he had spent three years at a time at Fort Lawton. Then he'd go to Thule Greenland for one year. Thule is very cold, very, very close. In fact, it's beyond the North, uh, uh, it's up above, it's around the North Pole. So he threatened me that if I didn't join the non-commissioned officers club, I'm going to Thule Greenland. And I told him, no, I wasn't. Well, I, normally you don't tell non-commissioned officers who outrank you that you're not going to do something. But I had, a, I had the ace in the hole because my term of service was coming up. So he couldn't send me over because I didn't have enough time to go. And when my time came up, I got out of there because I knew if I re-enlisted there, I, well, I was going to go. But I'd always wanted to go to Germany. And while I was in college, I had studied German for four years. Oh, while I was in high school, I studied Latin for two years. I don't speak Latin either. But <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to go to Germany because I was interested in the culture and a lot of things over there that I was, wanted to see. And uh, I contacted a friend of mine in, in Washington, D.C., found out uh, how I could get to Germany, and he told me how. And I wound up in Germany. And that was right before the, uh, the wall went up in Berlin. And uh, if you studied your history properly, and if you recall, after the, first, after the Second World War, West Germany was, Germany was partitioned between the French, the Americans, and the Russians. And uh, we were supposed to go to Bonn, which is in the American section at that sector. But since the French were not ready to perform the duties that they were needed to perform in southern Germany, which is that part of Germany, we were redirected to Munich. And that's why I spent three years. Uh, my, 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 my living quarters were in Munich, but my, my tactical unit was located at Dachau. And if you, uh, again, if you're familiar with uh, the atrocities that uh, were permit, were, happened in the Second World War, Dachau was one of the places where the Jews were killed in mass. And my unit was right above the incinerators that were still there. So it was a holy ground to the Jews. And that was, a, that was a Jewish compound right next to it. But anyway, after I finished there, I came right back to Seattle. And now I got out. Here I am in Seattle. In, 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 in uh, Olympia Lacey area. One thing I wanted to talk with you about, and my time is running short, is that I told you that I was a graduate of this particular institution back in 1972-73. When I came here, I was somewhat of a lone spot on the campus. Centralia, Chehalis area was a very segregated area. Uh, my classes, since I was working, normally lasted from 6 or 7 in the evening to 10 at night. For the two years that I came to class here, three or four nights a week, each time I left the campus, I had an escort to the entrance, to the egress to the uh, I-5 going north. It wasn't a very pretty sight, but I guess what I want to share with you before I leave here, you are living in a very volatile time, as you well know if you, if you follow the current events of the day. And you are living in a very changing world. Pay attention to what the census of 2010 
states the diversity of our communities are changing. When President Truman put out an executive order in 1948 to integrate the military services of the United States of America, he said, make the diversity of each unit within the military what the population ratio is. At that time, everybody, with the exception of us coloreds, was considered as white. And it was so, so deemed on all the military records. You were either a one for Caucasian, or you were a two, Negro. And that was the status. So we made everything was supposed to be 12.5% Negro. Well, when I went into the service in 1953, <clears throat> it hadn't changed. I mean, regardless of what the president said, commander in chief, military doesn't change that readily. Neither does the communities. You're familiar with what happened in the civil rights movement in the late 50s and 60s. Even today, there's still a tremendous amount of segregation. As I was indicated, I served as the mayor of my city for four years, from 04 through 07. I've been on the council since 1998. I serve as its deputy mayor today. But even today, as well as I am known in my own community, if I, you see me in a store, unless I'm pushing a basket, I have my hands clasped behind me because I know that I'm being watched very carefully to make sure that I don't pick up something and don't pay for it. You and the future leaders of our respective communities, you have to be aware that it's changing. There are more minorities in each community. And you, Caucasians, will be the minority within, the, you, within your lifetime. Within your lifetime, you'll be the minority. And you've got to be prepared to deal, not deal with it, but to be aware of it. Because you're going to be the leaders. You're going to own businesses. You're going to be shoppers. You're going to be purchasing property. You're going to be doing all the things that your parents are doing today. But you're going to be doing it differently. And I'm not going to say you're going to be doing it better, but you're going to be doing it differently. And hopefully it's better because your parents and perhaps your grandparents, who, for which I represent the generation of, haven't done a very good job of it. We thought we could. We thought we should because when we were at your age, we were going to change the world. Well, it hasn't changed. So with that, I'm going to say, for the next two or three minutes. If you have any questions of me, I'll be happy to answer it. If you don't, thank you very much for having me. Five more minutes? No, I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like that. <clears throat> sure. Ready for me to answer that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I didn't mention the fact that um, the things that I've done in, the, in my community, uh, but I have never stopped trying to learn. One of the things, I didn't tell you that I, I spent 32 years with the state of Washington as a manager with the Department of Transportation. And I'd walk into my office every morning and ask my staff, what did you learn yesterday? And if they told me they didn't learn anything, then I would tell them they did not earn their salary. 
because one of the things that you should do, or in fact, it should be a mandate, you've got to learn something new every day. Every day. Because the brain is continually waking all the time. But to answer your question, as a part of what I contributed to my community, I joined a service club called Kiwanis International. And it has some wonderful classes. And some of those classes dealt with leadership and communication. And when I was Lieutenant Governor of Division 38, which used to include Centray and Chehalis, and Grays Harbor, and Mason County, uh, big, 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 750 members at that time, uh, sometimes I had to uh, address them as a group. And those were businessmen. <laughs> those were the community leaders of their own respective communities. And so uh, you had to be on the ball if you're going to communicate with them. And I don't mean just talk to them. I mean say something to them that is relevant and receivable. And that I would say to, to you that that was my most relevant training for this particular activity within my life. Any other questions? Boy, I must be very good or you weren't listening. <laughs> Weather was good. Anyway, thank you very much for having me. I hope that uh, what I have said has been of some benefit to you. And I do wish you well in whatever your endeavors are. Thank you very much. Thank you.